All right. So this is put on your Tinfo T hat, and I'm Mia Bez. And um, I work for Estimouth. And uh, this talk is going to be about C++ templates, and it's going to be about scripting IDA Pro, or IDA as some call it. <clears throat> so C++ templates, they look like this. Basically, they solve the problem that we have this function max, and the code is equally valid for, it's valid for cars, it's valid for 32-bit ints, it's valid for signed ints, unsigned ints. So we don't want to write the code over and over. So we have this expression, and then type then is replaced by the compiler by whatever types you're using. And uh, <clears throat> then in the binary, you will end up with this. And this for whatever types are actually used. And then eventually your C++ uh, templates look like this. But um, it's fine when you're programming C++, but when you're in IDA Pro, then um, here you have some binary. The, there's a function, and the type of the function has uh, templates in it. So you go in the function, you hit Y to edit the type, and then you just press Enter. You don't edit it at all. You put in w what's in there, and then it says bad declaration. And uh, it says syntax error near something, and where the problem is is where you have that... Uh, angle bracket, and uh, it didn't get too far. So <clears throat> when you have these C++ templates, the type names can include the angle brackets, spaces, commas, which are all characters that IDA, IDA Pro doesn't accept in the names. So <clears throat> we still want to get those uh, templated types in there. So there's uh, three ways we can do it. And we're gonna use Python. That's a Texas Python or Rattlesnake. So the first way, there's a IDC function, get tinfo, and uh, it'll give you these tuple of two strings. The first one is the type expression, and the second one is the args, and we're gonna look at the, so if we get tinfo and we give it to apply type, then it, it works out. And this is the, the type part of it. So the first, this is some stuff in black, but we're gonna focus on the red and green part. And um, so they both start the same. The slash n or the 10 in there is, uh, is the pointer, it's a star. You could have several in a row if you have several stars in your type. Then you have the length, then you have the pound sign, which means there's an ordinal, and then there's two different ordinals. And then when you go into the local types subview, you see the ordinals, right? And then, so you decode them, there's math involved somewhat. And then we figured out that it's 1645 and 1398. That was actually the types. So then you can do the reverse operation, and then um, you can replace then those ordinals in that string you have, and then apply type and now it works again. So if, um, say from a PDB into your uh, local types, you've gotten already types that have uh, templates in them, now you can just uh, replace the ordinals and that string you got from IDA, and then uh, it still works. You magically uh, get the <clears throat> proper types in there. And then, that's one way of doing it. Sometimes that's a good way. Sometimes you want to do it another way. And actually, so when you're <clears throat> programming in C++, then the templated types, whatever, they have meaning. There's actual classes and types and whatever, and they are <coughs> uh, generated into the binary. There's a hierarchy, whatever. But actually, in terms of IDA, IDA doesn't know that the thing in the angle brackets is another type. To Ida, the whole thing is just a string. It's just like a type with a weird name that happens to have those symbols in them. So uh, you can actually <clears throat> then rename types to anything. And uh, <clears throat> so one way to get around the problem, so basically when you go into, into this view and you 
try to edit the type, or uh, in the when you try to apply a type to a function, it parses uh, the it parses your type declaration and also every type declaration declaration that is then referenced by that type. And uh, so if anywhere in that hierarchy of types that gets uh, parsed there's, uh, these bad characters, then it'll fail. So you can just, uh, whatever types are in your hierarchy, you rename them to something like temp1, temp2, whatever. Then you set the type, you apply the type to your function, and then you rename the types back, and that uh, achieves the same result. And uh, so this is an IP API that's called rename named type, and uh, unlike other IDA APIs, this one actually does exactly what it says. So then you call it for the original name, new name, and then you do the opposite operation after setting the type. Let me see how much, wow, okay. So then, the TinfoT API. Uh, this is in hex rays, I think. So uh, <clears throat> you create a TinfoT. Uh, so TinfO is type info, and an underscore T is just something that's on all of those types. Uh, and then you can call, call get name type on that TinfoT, and. Uh, where it says some crazy name lol, you can actually put in any string and uh, it'll create a tinfo t that, that has that name. And depending on whether you actually have then uh, a name with that, <coughs> I mean the local type with that name, then when you apply the tinfo, you get different results. But um, then, uh, <coughs> So the VDUI is, because uh, uh, much of the scripting for uh, hex rays is uh, intended so that when you're in the decompiler window and the user interface, then you can do stuff to what's visible in the window. So the VDU, so you have to then jump to the screen EA and open decompiler or whatever, and then you're able to get this VDUI object. And then, uh, <clears throat> To then change the types of of the of your function arguments, then you actually uh, you uh, you change uh, the types. Uh, L bar here is a local variable, so you change the types of the local vari variables that are the arguments. And uh, when you do that, um, it then changes the type of the function itself. And there's a the LVAR object itself has also a set type method at, which uh, would seem to do the same operation as going through the UI and then changing an LVAR's type, but uh, that other set type actually does a different thing or nothing. And that's why you need to go through this VDUI. Um, so here's the whole thing. You have to decompile it in there just to get it to open the decompiler window for you because otherwise you can't get the VDUI. And, uh, wow. So <clears throat> then there's the return type of the function. And so right there I was, uh, I was changing the arguments, <clears throat> the the local variables that are the arguments of the function, but um, the return type doesn't have a, even though there's a return, um, there's a local variable for the return um, variable or whatever, but if you change that type, it won't actually let you do it and it certainly won't change the return type of the function. And also when you're changing the, um, when you're doing this, uh, calling set LVAR type, you can actually add or remove arguments, 
which is something you might be interested in. So then uh, to create a completely arbitrary function type where you can specify the return type but also the number and types of the uh, arguments, you can do the following. So um, IDA has a, um, it has these uh, simple types and ordinal types and maybe some other types. And uh, in the simple types, there's a, as like a one byte uh, enumeration and uh, like 80% of them are weird stuff that you will never use like the static volatile O word pointer or this other one, which obviously is not actually a type, but static volatile unsigned double, but so on. And uh, <clears throat> so then you can create this, uh, your string that where you place these uh, placeholders or markers into your string for the return type and then for um, all the argument types, however many you want, and you give them different, uh, different uh, simple types, and then you uh, make them. You put in as many pointers as you want eventually, uh, and then you actually. So here, parse type uh, returns uh, the same type of uh, of that magic string that was in solution one. So then you can then do the replace thing. <clears throat> you can replace the however is encoded by IDA into the string, the, the, um, the simple types, then you can replace them with the <clears throat> how the ordinals are encoded. And in the, in the early example I showed, uh, it was always uh, the was always two bytes for the length of the, I mean the ordinal was always two bytes, but for like the first 1,000 ordinals, it will actually be uh, three bytes, and then, uh, I mean one byte, so the length will be three, and then beyond 4,000 or 8,000, the ordinal, when it goes above that, then it will be five bytes, but and then this, the math is slightly different, but you can then put in whatever you want, and then, uh, so this, uh, you can again create a tinfo t, and when you call deserialize on it and give it the whatever the IDC get tinfo function returns, that actually, uh, so um, it's another way of cre creating a tinfo that has a certain type because there's a uh, several functions in there that all seem to do the same thing like deserialize and parse type and uh, create function type and there's like 40 of them and if you look into the IDA API documentation, there isn't any. If you Google the function names, the only hits on Google are the mirrors of the header file and so there's no public usage of, of any of these APIs but this deserialize thing actually does what you want on the, if you have that type of string that you get from get info or parse type from IDC. So then <clears throat> there's a function called uh, apply info 2 because apply info was taken but it doesn't apply info. so then apply info 2 applies info, and now you can, this does the same as uh, what I write it in the first one. Let me see what it was. Apply type from IDC. Oops. Okay. Then here apparently is the whole thing. And then that is all I have to say about this topic. And wow, I was fast even for a 20 minute slot. <laughs> Any questions? You.
Uh, so the question is, uh, like, when would you end up with these types that cannot be parsed? So basically, let's say you have a binary that you don't have symbols for or whatever, and then, but that includes a statically linked uh, library written in C++, and then you build that um, C++ library yourself with symbols, and then you will then have those uh, symbols in there, and you want to transfer those uh, symbols into the unknown binary, and then, then because these uh, are completely like normal C++ types, but IDA just can't parse them because they have angle brackets, commas, and spaces, so that's, that's like the common situation where you'd end up with this. Or in general, if, if you, it's, uh, you, you know something about the types that's not in the binary and it's C++ templates. Yeah, yeah. And basically for IDA, then, as I mentioned somewhere in there, all those uh, templated types, they're just names of types that happen to be weird, and IDA doesn't actually care about like what the members of the template are, or like how the how the structure is formed of its uh, members. If you have more questions, I have a mic that makes it easy for everyone to hear. So who's got a question? Anybody? Did this all go over your heads? There's only two smart guys in the entire room. All right, thank you guys. <laughs>